In this segment, we're going to talk about a form of local explanations, which is going to be various ways of highlighting the input in order to try to show what input features are particularly relevant for understanding the model's prediction. So this returns to the idea of counterfactual kind of examples uh, or perturbations of a single input. So essentially what we want to say is if the model's input were x prime instead of x, what would the prediction be? And so here's an example from sentiment where we say the movie was not great, in fact it was terrible, and the model predicts negative. Now if we hide the word great, the model still predicts the, the, the model still predicts negative. But if we hide the word terrible, it predicts positive. So what this should tell us somehow is that terrible is important for this model, and great doesn't seem to be as important. So this gives us maybe the idea that one way to think about explanations is that we might perturb the input a whole bunch of times and see how perturbations around each token impact the model's prediction. Uh, and so this is the idea behind a technique called LIME, uh, due to Marco Tulio Ribeiro and uh, co-authors from University of Washington. So LIME stands for Locally Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. So there's a couple of pieces here. It's a local method because we're thinking about explaining the model's behavior on a single example. And it's model agnostic because we are treating the model as a black box. We are not, for example, assuming that the model is, you know, a fully differentiable uh, model that depends on parameters, you know, that we learned through gradient descent or anything like that. Um, we can apply this to any technique that we have. So here's how it works. We take uh, our input. Here we're going to show some examples in terms of images, but uh, this can be applied to text as well, like we saw on the previous slide. And you break it up into a bunch of chunks. So here, these are little regions of an image. Uh, for text, these might be short phrases or single words. And then you run prediction with different subsets of the chunks being present. And this gives you an idea of which chunks kind of impact the model's prediction. Although, of course, you can't run with every single subset of chunks. And so what you have to do is you have to try to figure out, okay, over the, over the kind of sample of, the sample of chunk subsets that we have, which chunks are actually, you know, contributing to the uh, classification decisions. So the basic idea here is that we want to take these predictions on subsets of these components and then we actually want to train another model that explains which components contribute to the model's predictions most strongly and then whatever that model thinks is important is what's overall the explanation that we're going to return. So let's dive into this in a little bit more detail. Um, we take our input and we have this notion of binary masks where we have d prime little chunks of input and the way that we're going to think about modifying this input is by sampling a binary mask over these uh, d prime chunks. All right, and so we can draw a bunch of new input samples uh, and then actually, f well, we could draw x primes, which are masks, and then we're going to say x double prime represents the new input example that's formed by applying that mask to the input. Uh, and then we compute f of x double prime. This is just going to be the result of our classifier. So what this does is then we uh, we get a bunch of individual decisions based on f of x double prime, and then we want to learn a simple classifier that says, okay, based on x prime, based on which chunks I'm including or not, can I predict wh what the model's final prediction f of x double prime is going to be? So let's say in this model we say, all right, you know, chunk 3 has a very, very high correlation with the positive class here and the model overall predicted positive. What that means is that, okay, if I see chunk three, I'm likely to predict positive. If I don't see it, I'm much less likely to predict positive. And what that tells us is that chunk three is probably very important for the model's prediction because across all these different subsets that we're seeing, 
uh, we're kind of getting this understanding that chunk three contributed a lot to the probability of the uh, kind of label being positive. So there's a, there's a lot of kind of tricky things about designing and applying this method. Uh, one is that if we have, a, you know, imagine in a limiting case, our chunk is just the entire input, like the entire image or the entire sentence or something like that, then we know that that whole chunk is extremely important for the model's prediction, but of course we have no fidelity here, right? We can't actually say anything useful about it as an explanation because we're looking at it, something that's too big or too coarse. So, and then conversely, you know, you could break it up in terms of, say, individual pixels in an image, but then maybe you can't necessarily interpret what's going on. You get that, okay, these pixels, you know, you know, we got eight pixels over here, eight over here, nine over here, and kind of random patches. That doesn't really give you a very satisfying explanation. So they evaluated this by looking at a couple of models where we know the explanation. So they looked at a sparse logistic regression model and a decision tree model. And again, these are models that I would say are transparent. They, you know, just by looking at them, we, we understand how they behave. But what they were doing was trying to say, all right, can our black box explanation technique explain the behavior of these models? And what they were looking at was, can it recover the features that we know these models to be using? Uh, and, you know, it turned out it was able to do this pretty well and better than some other existing techniques at the time. Okay, so Lime is great, but there are some issues with applying it to a wide range of problems. And one of those issues is that when you zero out features, you're changing the input in a fairly dramatic way. And so for tasks like sentiment analysis, where we often think about models as kind of additive, right? Like, you know, it's like you have two sentences with positive sentiment and one with negative. And if you removed the negative sentence, you would just get more positive. And, you know, if you removed a positive sentence, it would just kind of balance out. But that's not actually how it works every time. A lot of times a model really expects data to be taken from a particular distribution. Um, and we'll call this the data manifold. Uh, so a manifold is basically just a shape uh, or, or kind of low dimensional surface in a very high dimensional space. And the idea is that there are certain natural sentences or natural images, and that's what the model is going to expect to see. So once we start zeroing out a bunch of features or masking out a bunch of stuff, we're no longer seeing a natural sentence. And our model might just behave unpredictably here. And so what comes out of this Lyme procedure may not actually be that reliable because maybe the model's you know, making certain decisions when it's kind of seeing data points it's comfortable with. And then as soon as you're masking stuff, it's doing something totally weird and crazy that it wasn't because it wasn't trained to see those examples. So another approach is to think about sort of going even more local. Like, why don't we think about instead of zeroing out a whole patch of uh, input features, what happens if we just think about a sort of very small perturbation? And one way we can do this is by taking gradients. So uh, again, this method was uh, kind of pioneered for computer vision back in 2013 by Simonian et al. And the basic idea is that we're going to think of the current data point as yielding some prediction, and we're going to do a first order Taylor approximation of the scoring function around that point. Um, so what we do is we take the derivative of the model score with respect to the input image or the input text if you're doing natural language processing. This is different than when we normally think about gradients. Normally we think about taking the derivative of a loss with respect to the parameters and then updating the parameters. So we're kind of flipping it around where now the parameters are constant, but we're taking the derivative with respect to the image. So what this tells us is that, all right, let's say there's some pixel that has a very high gradient magnitude. What that says is if I change this pixel, then I will change my prediction by a lot. 
And that tells us that this pixel maybe is very, its value is very important, right? The model seems very sensitive to it. And so if it had a lower value in this counterfactual way of thinking about things, then the model would make a very different prediction. And so, you know, the nice thing about computer vision examples is that they can have some nice visualizations. And so uh, here we can kind of get a sense of, for certain object classes, why the model's making its predictions. And, you know, it's, it's hard to fully tell what's going on here, but uh, we at least get a sense that, okay, the model seems to be clued into pixels that are related to these kind of distinctive central features of the image. Uh, and, you know, we might th think that it's likely to be looking at the right thing. Now, importantly, we can't actually tell whether this is a good ex explanation method just from looking at these pictures. Because what we don't know is if we removed these pixels the model set is important, would the prediction change? This kind of counterfactual thing is not being evaluated here. But regardless, it at least gives us some confidence that either something is reasonable ha is happening in the model or you know the explanation technique at least aligns with what we kind of expect the model to be doing. All right, the la and the last, uh, this kind of variant of this I'll mention is a technique called integrated gradients. And the idea here is the following. So one way that the, this gradient-based technique can fail is if our local approximation around our final data point is not very good. So suppose we have two features A and B and the prediction is an OR of these two. Then if both of these are set to one, you know, and, and imagine this is a soft OR operation, you know, changing either feature in isolation doesn't actually look like it changes the prediction very much, right? Because the OR just kind of pulls it up back up to the other one. So we can look at this and say, okay, well, if we changed A or if we change B, you know, neither of those actually is contributing very much to the prediction. So the idea behind integrated gradients is we think about a bunch of points along a path from the origin, basically some you know, neutral sentence that just has like zero word vectors in it, up to our actual sentence. And we kind of you know, incrementally like make the sentence look more like the real sentence along this path. And we do the same kind of gradient-based trick everywhere along the way. And so what's gonna happen here is that uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see that, okay, rather than everything being kind of saturated, along the way we'll say, okay, well, actually, if we changed B here and raised it a little bit, that would improve the prediction. Um, or if we changed A here, that would, that would improve the prediction because we're not, you know, we're not at the saturation point anymore. So by going along the path, we get a better sense of maybe which features are, uh, uh, you know, are, are kind of important without thinking about it so locally as like, all right, every other feature is here and I'm just missing this one, which doesn't do a good job when you have uh, kind of multiple independent signals that tell us what the right thing is. So this gives you a kind of tour of the ways that people produce these sorts of highlights like we, like we were seeing for images and you could produce the same thing for text, the, you know, these, these sort of sentiment style uh, or these, these highlights for tasks like sentiment where we see them pulling out the words that are most crucial to the prediction. So these, these sorts of techniques can be very useful for helping visualize models and, and understanding what they're doing, uh, and they can be part of your debugging process as you think about building a model and, and trying to kind of push its capabilities and uh, make sure that it's doing something that we really want it to be doing. That's the end of the segment.